Looking into episode 27 tonight, we will talk with one of the most prolific champions of all time at multiple levels. High school state championships, FIBA world championships, college championships, EuroLeague premier championships, and he is a true champion in every facet of the word, Mr. Darius Miller. This episode 27 is brought to you by Anchor.fm and Mount Orb Sports Complex. This week's week-long series is titled Through the Eyes of a Champion. In part one, we spoke with 2007 Georgetown High School, Ohio High School Athletic Association state champion, Jay Chadwell, along with 2019 NAIA national champion from Georgetown College, LJ Cowherd. Last night, we spoke at length with Pikeville University head coach and athletic director, Coach Kelly Wells, on his Mason County High School and Pikeville University successes and how he builds culture in his programs. All syndications of this podcast and past podcasts can be heard at the following streaming sites, Anchor.fm, Radio Public, CastBox, Breaker Radio, Pocket Cast, Spotify, Google Podcast, and Apple Podcast. Again, this week's series is titled Through the Eyes of a Champion. We've talked this week about the process of winning championships and some of the qualities that it takes to win a championship and what winning a championship looks like. And when I think of championship, some of the following words come to mind. Hard work, dedication, commitment, sacrifice, purpose, goals, ethics, and mindset. Championship mindset. You can have a winning mindset, but it's not any good if you're not able to share that winning mindset and provide that winning mindset to others. And so there are many traits that building a championship quality program consists of. And we're going to talk about some of those tonight, and we're going to get some answers on some of those tonight. Um, as we spoke on yesterday, every single phase of a championship is a life process along with what you have to do in sports. It's a life process. And that's what matters. And it's important to understand that to be at the top, to reach that peak, to reach that pinnacle, and to be at the top of the mountain, you have to be willing to do what everyone else is not willing to do. And in most cases, that means a lot of lifestyle changes. That means getting rid of some bad habits, not acquiring bad habits, staying away from uh, the wrong type of person, the wrong type of people. And those are all things that champions fall into place with. And sometimes it's consciously and sometimes it's subconsciously. But those are all things that happen for those people in order for them to win, especially people that win at different levels. And so... People who have won championships are geared a little bit different. And people who have won multiple championships are geared a little bit different than people who have just won championships. And people who are the ultimate version of the word champion, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Bill Russell, Lou Alcindor, um, just to name a few, are all people who are geared and built different than everyone else. And so people who win championships at multiple levels are just flat out built differently than everyone else in everyone else in sports. And 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 that may offend some people and some people it may not, but it, you know, it, it's it's my my privilege or my right to be able to express my opinion. And in my opinion, if you win championships at different levels, you're geared different than everyone else. And that's just the way it is. It's important to understand that it's not luck or, 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 or 100% destiny. It is a level or a mentality that separates how a true champion goes about their business. And it's a lifestyle deal. Like I said, it's day to day. And that's what makes them able to be prevalent or, or, or relevant in the sports world. 
And those same people are the people that are relevant in the workforce and are relevant in any other facet of life. Those people, most of the time, have a trait that will allow them to rub off on others and make those people also be champions and bring championship qualities to them as well. And so tonight, like I said, we're going to talk with a very, very special guest. And we will get into detail when he touches base with us about some of the things that he has been able to do and some of the things that he was able to bring to the different programs that he was a part of that allowed him to be a champion, be a winner, be someone who could rub off in the locker room, on the practice floor, in the classroom, in the library at study table, in the weight room. A true champion embodies all those qualities that they take with them everywhere that they go. And our guest tonight is, is one of those people. And he's a very humble individual and an individual that is comes from a very good family. His dad was on the show a few nights ago and spoke vividly of his career and his ability to be able to manifest a winning mentality in Darius. And so, you know, you have to be able to understand that one of the things that a champion does is their work ethic and their ability to, to get after it every single day is different than anyone else's. And they put other things in life first from a priority standpoint, whether it be God, whether it be school, whether it be family, they have a good understanding of all of those things and the importance of how important that they are in order to be successful or to be a winner. And so in the past episode, I really bared down on the word culture. And I talked a lot about culture and, and how important it was to build the culture and that, a, and that a championship wasn't built overnight and that so much of it and the importance of it was getting the buy-in from everyone in the program and understanding that you have to put a priority list together in order to be able to achieve anything. You got to know what your priorities are because if your priorities are all over the place, it's hard to win a championship. And so that is another thing that we didn't really talk about on the other episode was priorities and how important priorities are and how important it is to know who needs to be where and who needs to go where and how you align your personal lifestyle to put you in a position to be successful. And so those are all just some of the things that it takes, but they're not all of the things that it takes. And so, you know, we want to move on and I want to revert back to yesterday and I want to go talk yesterday about how important coach Wells said that it was to never give up on the process of trying to get guys together. And Coach Wells talked yesterday about a lot about his 2011 state championship team or NAI national championship team that was not able to get things done throughout the course of the season, but then they were able to pull it together at the end of the year. This episode is brought to you by Mount Arm Sports Complex and Anchor.fm. So let's go ahead and bring on our guest. This man is the true meaning of champion. He's literally won at every single level he's ever participated at. A 2008 state champion in the state of Kentucky. 
2008 Mr. Basketball, 2008 Kentucky State High School, State Tournament MVP, 1,000-point score, 20-point-per-game average, 8-rebound-per-game average, 4-assist-per-game average, 2-steal-per-game average. That's for his career in high school. Four-star recruit, ranked eighth in the country at the small forward position coming out of high school, signed a letter of intent to play at the University of Kentucky. While there, he earned another long list of accolades, being all-conference rookie team as a freshman in the SEC. That summer, he represented the under-19 USA team in New Zealand in the FIBA World Championships, winning gold. And during his time at the University of Kentucky, he also scored over 1,000 points and played in 152 games, which makes him number one all-time in Wildcat history in games played, which makes him also the winningest player in Wildcat history. He is fourth all-time in the NCAA in games played. He represented the USA yet again in 2011 in the World University Games in China. And he is known around where we are from as Mr. Clutch. He has uh, the clutch gene, and he's hit big shot after big shot throughout his career, high school, college, and professionally. 2012 national champion, SEC tournament MVP in 2011, SEC six man of the year in 2012, BBL finals MVP in 2016, all BBL first team in 2017, winning not one, not two, but three BBL Premier League championships and current New Orleans Pelican and the all-time winningest player in Kentucky history again, 2008 Miss Mason County graduate and 2012 University of Kentucky graduate, my guy, Mr. Darius Miller. D. Mills, how's the quarantine life treating you? It's good, man. I appreciate you having me on here, but it's been good just uh, spending time with the fam and uh, trying, to, trying to work out a little bit. When it comes to basketball success, you are on another level. You want it every stop, and, and, and you go through your preparation a little different than everyone else. What is it that makes you able to believe and achieve at every level the ultimate goal, and that's to win the championship? Um, honestly, I've, I've, been, I've been blessed to be on a lot of good teams, be in a lot of good programs, uh, picked up a lot of habits over the over the time. So I've just been in great circumstances, and um, we've had the teams that that that's all have have has all have had one goal in mind. So it's been pretty easy, honestly. You know, I'm gonna go back to the high school days, and and it goes far beyond the high school days. It goes back to elementary school. But the group of guys that you played with at Mason County when you were in high school was very very special group of guys. You guys were led when you were younger by Micah, who got to play with Chris and those guys. And then you were able to 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 excel early as a freshman and a sophomore. But you were fortunate because you got a chance to play with another group of really special guys as an eighth grader and, and play in a state tournament and, and contribute. How much did that experience prepare you for the run that you would ultimately make your senior year um, in 2008? That was huge. Just just being able to be in that atmosphere, uh, feel that feeling of getting that far and then see how those guys prepared and what it took to get there. I mean, I think that fueled my whole high school career, honestly. I mean, just wanting to win and wanting to get back there. School and, and I, I know that your Mason County team was the biggest Mason County team in history, probably. You guys had a lot of size and you had a lot of length. But people don't understand, like, how good guys like Ethan King and Russ Middleton were. You know, like, the guys that were the fourth and fifth starter on your team. How did those guys go about their business on the day-to-day, -day, like, in terms of being able to separate Darius Miller is one of the best players in the country and Trevor Setti is one of the best players in the state, but their mind state was we're as good as they are, and I think that's why your team was that good. Was that kind of a filler for you and Trevor to like kind of push those guys to be as per, to reach their potential? Um, I think honestly, we 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 had kind of an advantage because we played together for so long, man. We had been playing together since like fourth, fifth grade or something like that. So we grew up playing together, knew how each other wanted to play, and I think that 
that gave them the confidence to be like, man, we've been doing this our whole life. The same way it gave us the confidence, too. So, I mean, we've been playing together that whole time. We knew exactly how to play with one another. And, and we had fun doing it. So, I think that's what pushed us to go uh, and win a championship in the end. What is a, a championship man, man, t- mentality to you? Like, what it, what is it in your mind that you feel like separates you from others? Um, man, uh, as far as I won't, I won't just say me, but I, I feel like the person that wants to win, win a championship, uh, it takes a lot of sacrifice, um, a lot of focus and dedication. Uh, but that's not just one person; it's the whole team. I mean, you're only as good as your weakest player on your team, so. I feel like if if one play, if one team has the right mindset, everybody's focused, locked in on the same goal, that makes it so much easier. And that team will always go far in the end. During your career, from the early years, you've always competed against some of the best players, not regionally, but in the country. Who were some of the guys that you competed against that forced you to take your game to another level on a national scale? Uh, back when I was younger? Yes. Oh, man. Uh, well, it started at my, on my AAU team. Just every time we would have practice, I was playing against O.J. Mayo and Bill Walker, who was like two of the best high school basketball players I've ever seen. And then, uh, I mean, you had Chris. Grew up playing against Chris. He used to beat me and my cousins at the YMCA all the time. Uh, my pops um, played against everybody, really, man. Doug, Wesley Jones, uh Sean, all them guys, man. Right. Just playing against older, older talent, playing against you, just people who was competitive and pushed, pushed me. So, I mean, just it was a, it was a lot of different players, man, on a lot of different levels. But everything was competitive, and uh, I love doing it. So, it helped me to become the player that I am. And that allows me to skip over my next question because I wanted to just talk for a second. It's, it's, it was a two part question, but the only part of it now is. You know, let's talk about your hometown. Let's talk about Maysville. You just mentioned a bunch of guys from your hometown that played basketball. But growing up, what did what did Maysville mean to you? Like, how much, how important was it for you to represent Maysville with it being such a smaller town? Um, it was very important to me. And uh, just going back to talk about the guys that I that I just mentioned a little bit ago. I mean, I feel like all those guys took pride and and where they were from because there was a lot of hoopers around that area. So, like I said, when, when every time I seen them play, it was competitive. And uh, they took a pride in where they were from, playing against team from out of state, out of the city, to whatever you want to say. And, I mean, that kind of developed in me. With your dad being from South Bend, Indiana, a lot of people don't know your dad is from South Bend, Indiana, went to Moorhead yeah. State University. Um, a lot of your family still lives in Indiana. Were you raised a Notre Dame or Indiana fan, or, or was it always Big Blue for you? Uh, I was more like – I liked players when I was younger mm-hmm. more than teams. Uh, I wasn't re- never really a Notre Dame fan. Therefore, at the time, I was a U.K. fan because uh, my granny was a U.K. fan. So um, I really liked players more than more than programs and teams like that, really. Yep. Your dad was was on was a guest on our show last series, and um, him and I have developed. You you know how close your dad and I are. He's a very good friend right. of mine. We've developed a close bond over the past twenty five years or so. How yeah. much of an impact did he have on your career and development, and and how was he able to push you beyond what was inside your bubble to be the 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 eighth best small forward in the country and the the being the top 50, you know, in the country, being from Maysville, how was he able to push you? Um, I mean, he was a, he was the whole key, really, because uh, growing up, the only reason I played basketball is because I see my dad playing all the time, and I wanted to be like my dad. So, I mean, without him, I, I wouldn't be here. But even without that, I mean, just growing up with him, he, he was a very good basketball player and a very competitive basketball player. So, from my early age, he would just play me one on one and just beat me. Like, no, no taking it easy on me. He would just beat me, and then um, he kept doing it until I <laughs> until I got big enough to beat him. I I um I remember watching those one on one games when you were younger and seeing how competitive they were. But I was 
watching or I was witnessing, we were all witnessing like greatness in the making because he never took it easy on you. But he also right. never allowed you, he never forced you. You know, a lot of people think they have to force their kids to play. And he right. never forced you to play. It was always no, when, you, when you was ready to go home, pack it up. Let's go home. Right. You know what I mean? And right. so it's 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 a it's a it's a good feeling to see that situation personally and see it work out where you don't have to just be, you know, pounding the hammer on the nail all the time trying to get something out of a kid more out of them than what they want to give. You've always been a great teammate and you've always been a great leader. How are you able to put your personal goals aside to 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 better the team? A lot of guys are not able to do that. And you do it as well as anybody. And you can be the best player on the team when need to be, but you can also be the third or fourth best player on the team when need to be. But you always win. And winning is your ultimate goal. What are some of your personal qualities that allow you to be able to compartmentalize when you need to go and when you need to stay within the flow? Um, I think, I think um, that's just the way that I learned how to play the game. Uh, that's, that's the way most people from where we're from play the game. They play the game the right way. My pops has played the game the right way the whole since, I mean, since I was growing up. So that's, that's just the way that I've learned. And, um, I mean, throughout my years, I've learned that every player that's on a successful team gets to eat. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, it's just the way that it is. Mm -hmm. If your team wins, everybody eats. So mm -hmm. I try to do my best to explain that to everybody, every team that I'm on. And, uh, Fortunately, I've, been, I've had some great teammates, and it's worked out for me. That's a very good answer. You you have had a star-studded cast of teammates from high school, throughout college, into the pros. Um, and here in a bit, I'm going to give you some names of some guys, and I just want you to give me, you know, your your analysis of of, the, of those players, just a sentence or a phrase or a word, just to help the general public that don't know those type of people get a, get a closer, a closer, you know, feel for what those people are like. Um, I know something that was very special to you was um, your cousin Tyrese came from Indiana to play high school basketball with you. And I, and I know that watching you grow up and watching you play, that was one of the most pleasurable parts of being in high school for you was getting to play with him. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, uh, that's like my brother and uh, we're really close still to this day. And, just growing up and having somebody that, that you have that special bond with on the court and, and, and being successful together was, it, it was, it was amazing. You ended up playing with 18 NBA players over four years at the university of Kentucky. Uh, yeah. Brent and I figured it out today. How was the experience being in a pro professional environment while in college, knowing that you were essentially every day in practice, not training for the next game, but training, training for the next phase of life, which was the NBA, um, it that has to be more than just basketball that goes that goes on that you know that went on in the Joe Craft Center at the, at that time. Uh, it was that was probably the best thing for me, honestly, because uh, playing against players like that every single day. Me personally, I felt like every day that I came into practice, I was competing against the best players in the country. So. Every single day, it was competitive. Cal made sure of that, and uh, the players on the team was competitive, so we pushed each other, and uh, that really helped me to grow. So, I mean, I was blessed to be in that situation, play with all those guys, and we pushed each other every single day, and it turned me into the player I am today. Which is a, a great basketball player. So, at, at one point during your senior year, you were going through – this is in college. This is 2012, 2011, uh -huh. 2012. You were going through somewhat of a slump, and legend has it that your close friend and teammate, Michael Kidd Gilchrist, had a meeting with Coach Cal and requested that Coach Cal start you just to kind of help you get a jump start on get going, going into the tournament. People, A lot of people, don't, you started for your first three years at Kentucky. And then because of who you are and because of your humility and your ability to adjust to all situations and not let it affect you, you came off the bench. You hit that slump. Legend has it, Michael Kidd Gilchrist went and talked to Coach Cal. You come out, you score 16 points. It propelled you to having a phenomenal national tournament and ultimately winning the national championship. 
how much was that gesture of MKG? How much, how, how much did that mean to you and how important was that for your team at the time? Do you think? Um, it was very important, man, because I mean, that goes back to what I was talking about earlier. It just showed that everybody had the same goal. It didn't matter who was getting the credit or, or what anybody was getting out of it. We all knew if we won, then everybody would eat from it. And, um, Gilly, Gilly, like you said, I was struggling there for a little bit and, um, Gilly went up and talked to coach and then Gilly came and told me. So, I mean, that was really a boost for me and the whole team. So we was all, we all knew we was together and united and ready to go at that point. So you as Darius Miller, okay, are one of the best one-on-one players that I've ever seen. I'll put you against anybody one-on-one. And I've seen you play one-on-one against some of the best players in the world. Now, you are such a good one-on-one player because you are the protege of one of the best one-on-one players that I've ever seen. Your dad is still one of the best one-on-one players I've ever seen. And I was talking to Brent, and I was like, look, he told me, he said, Father Time catches up with everybody. I said, he ain't never caught up with B. Mill. (laughs) <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's not true, but you are one of the best one-on-one players I've ever seen. And because your dad was one of the best is one of the best one-on-one players I've ever seen. How and where did you develop your ability to get a shot whenever you want it? Um, I mean, I think that comes back to, like I said, just growing up playing against guys like him playing against Chris Wesley, Sean, just playing against you, all them guys. Like, when I was real young, y'all was real competitive. Y'all wasn't taking it easy on me. So I had to find a way to get my shot off. And, um, I mean, it just kind of stuck with me from from that early age. Second part of that question, how do you maintain the high-level IQ to know exactly when you need it and when you – when you need to score, when you need to score, and when you need to get others involved, your IQ is so high. That's what makes you so great. You have such a high basketball IQ. And in that 2008 state tournament game, there were a couple of possessions or more than a couple possessions. There were a couple of times when the Holmes crowd, crowd got loud and the the atmosphere turned. And it was kind of like Rupp. It was, it, was, it was like a U.K. game at Rupp. There was so much blue and white that night. And Trevor didn't get the, you know, they ended up letting Trevor play late or whatever the situation yep. was. But, and I don't even believe that Trevor scored, but just him being in that game was 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 detrimental to that success. But knowing you didn't have Trevor, it was like, boom, I got to go. And in that second half, especially in that fourth quarter, the last four or five minutes of the game, you became a pit bull. How do you know when it's time to go and when it's time to just keep everybody else involved enough to where, you know, we need to stay in it until I can get going? Uh, well, in that situation, um, it, w- it was really easy. Like I was saying earlier, we had been playing together for so long. Uh, I couldn't. Ach- I kind of knew when to pick and choose my, my points to attack. Uh, but, I mean, as you get older, you just have to have a feel for the game and, and, your, and your teammates, I feel like. Um, sometimes you won't be that person that has to do that. And other times you will. So, I mean, it just goes along with having a, a, a good feel for the game, really. How did the loss in uh, 2007, your junior year, against future Cardinal Preston Knowles and Clark County affect your mentality? And what did that mean for you in terms of, okay, here's what I got to do. Here's what I got to get my guys to do. And – Here's what needs to happen in order for us to move forward to make sure that what happened last year doesn't happen next year. How, how did that affect you, that loss? Um, I was really frustrated by it. Um, I felt like we should have won. Uh, Preston was a great player. We all know that, though. He uh, did what he had to do. But, um, I mean, I feel like that fueled the whole team coming back, especially me. Uh, it was really a, a rough loss for us, and – we just wanted to get that taste out of our mouth because we felt like we should have been the best team in the state this year. Let's talk about Bud Mackey for a minute. He was another dog uh-huh. during your era. Uh, you guys went up there to Scott County and uh, I believe suffered a loss, either your junior, it must have been your junior year. And I could see the disappointment from you that night, You the, the frustration. And, and I think that there were several things that happened 
during that couple of years that were like a build up to making it no longer about how skillful are we, how good are we, but I don't want to feel like this anymore. Is, is that part of it? Um, definitely, definitely. And uh, we have been waiting for that moment for such a long time when we were younger. And then finally, like our junior years, we were the guys that were up. We were getting our chance and then, and then we lose, you know. So, I mean, I feel like that kind of fueled all of us for our senior year, our senior year going back and um, kind of kept a bad taste in our mouth for the whole senior season and kept us locked in. You have developed a great basketball relationship through the years that has turned into a great friendship uh, with Shove and Matt. Talk to us a little bit about that relationship and the bond that the two of you have created over the years um, during adolescence and through high school. And the, are you guys still close today? Um, definitely, definitely. Um, my gosh, yeah, we played AAU together back in, um, I, th- I guess, from like seventh, eighth grade to senior year. That's when we became close, uh, competed against each other in high school. Our teams matched up against each other a couple times, and uh, we just remained close the whole time. I mean, it's always been a good friend of mine, and he's just a real good, genuine dude. Um, Briefly, just very briefly, um, take us through um, all in one question. Take us through your D1 Greyhound days, which you did that a little bit. Just expand on that a little bit, and then tell us about the 2008 state championship, um, the poster year. I call it the poster year. That's the year that the first game of the year you played uh, St. Pat and, and uh, there were T-shirts made of the dunk, <laughs> whoever that poor guy was. And then just walk us through your 2012 state ch- uh, national championship year and just tell us some similarities between the high levels of basketball at each level that it took to win those to win at those three levels. Gotcha. Um, with the AAU, I mean, that was really high level. Like I said, Bill uh, Walker, OJ Mayo, Shelvin was on that team. Um, my guy, William Buford. There was just a lot of talented guys on the team, which um, really helped me to realize just how, how good people around the country are, man. Just traveling with them, playing with them, playing against other high level guys around the country. And then, um, my, the championship year in high school, uh, we had such a talented team. We had such good chemistry. We all had amazing fun playing together. And then that was pretty much the same thing my senior year at Kentucky, too. Uh, it was a amazing experience because both teams wanted the same thing. Um, they wanted a championship. Everybody was locked in. Everybody was just laser focused on the championship. And that's... Uh, Two of the better teams that I've been a part of, as far as that goes, just being locked in, focused on winning the championship, and um, obviously it ended in the championship. So those are two experiences that helped fuel me through my whole career and just two of the best, probably two of the best experiences I've had on the basketball court. How cool of it was an experience, how cool of an experience was it representing your country, playing in the FIBA World Championships 19, 19 and under? Oh man, that was that was amazing just uh, to be a part of that whole experience. Uh, we had a really good team, played against some really talented players. Just to see the difference in um, styles of basketball between Europe and uh, America was amazing, and um, just the whole atmosphere, the whole experience was just one of the best experiences I've had. Man, do you ever talk to uh, to a uh, buddy? The walk on. I remember. I remember. Uh, <laughs> we came. I ain't talked. I ain't talked to him in a little bit. It's been a minute. <laughs> we, we came to. Uh, this is just a little funny story. Brian Miller and Trevor Setti and myself <laughs> and my little cousin Jeremy. We go up to the Joe Craft to play open gym at UK. And I walk in and I'm looking around the gym. I'm like, who am I gonna guard? <laughs> it's like JT, you got him. And you, and you, you got buddy. <laughs> and I think dude was just there that one year, man. But that was that was a fun that was a fun day because your dad was up there like mad because we we did we only won a couple of games. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah, he, you know how competitive. I'm like is. I'm like these dudes <laughs> these dudes are in the SEC and we're old, B. You know what I'm saying? Like we're not supposed to win. No, yeah, he was going hard too. That's bull, JT. We are supposed to win. <laughs> Let, he was uh, going hard. 
Let's talk about something that we are both very familiar with. It's been a big part of your life. The Maysville Girls Gym and the Dirt Bowl. Yep. Man, uh, it's, that's, that's been some of the best experiences, too. Just having fun with people that you grew up with, playing with Chris, playing with Wesley, my pops, you, playing with Sean, you know, Sims, all those guys. Very competitive, a lot of trash talking going on. Just guys that I grew up playing against, they used to beat up on me when I was younger, so I enjoy, I enjoy beating up on them when it, as I got older. You know what I'm saying? So, so. And, uh, yeah, the dirt bowl, man, it's always a good time, fun, man. Everybody enjoys it. It's always competitive. So the the high school state championship, the national championship AAU, the national championship in college, the 19U FIBA World Championships, everything that you've done up to this point that we've talked about has all been – a build up to draft day and you worked your whole life for it. And you, you, you hear your name called on the first day within the first two hours of the draft. What was that experience like? I can't even explain it. Honestly, man, Jen, getting to experience it with, uh, all my friends and close family and stuff. It was just amazing. Like you said, I've been working for that my whole life. And, um, uh, that's always been my goal from the beginning. So, just to experience that with my family was one of the best moments of my life. Now you're drafted. You're heading to New Orleans. You're in a great situation because you get to go play with your teammate that you had just won a national championship with. How special was that, and how quick did you have to up and relocate to New Orleans after draft day? Um, I went down pretty early. I, pr- I, pr- I can't remember. I can't remember exactly when I went down, but I went down pretty early right after. I was so excited. It was a pretty quick turnaround, and it was it was amazing to just be a part of that whole thing and get down here and work and just to see the differences between the NBA and the college level. You play a couple seasons. You fulfilled your dream. You, your contract is up, and there's no extension. And now it's time for the next phase. And you're familiar with basketball in Europe because Chris has played over there for so many years, and you go that route. How was that experience, and what did it do for you in terms of your mission to always get back to the league? Because you are one of the few players, like with a lot of other things that you've done, you're one of the few players that has made it back into the NBA. What made you know that could happen? Because for a lot of guys, I get a contract, I go through my contract, my contract doesn't get renewed, I go to Europe, I play in the Premier League, I make a career over there and I never make a play to get back in the NBA. I knew your goal was to get back when you left. How much was that experience, how important was that experience going over there, playing, and going back to back to back? Um, it was it was really important for me. Uh, just growing up, that was about around the same time as I had my oldest daughter. So uh, me and my wife and my oldest daughter went over there, and it was just – an amazing experience for me and really good for me because uh, I had to grow up. It was a lot different than the NBA, um, way different than anything that I have experienced. Uh, you you work uh, two a days, it's a grind, and um, it really helped me to grow up and it really helped me to grow as a player because I had a lot of freedom over there, so I got to get back into my Mason County, Kentucky type of mentality where I was on the attack at all times and and trying to make more plays. So mm-hmm. it was huge for me as a player, and um, it was huge for me off the court too because uh, it made me grow up in a hurry, me and my wife. And, I mean, we just became different people from the whole experience. That's great. So you, you get back in the league, and now you're leading the league in three-point percentage, and you're playing really well. Did you feel a sense of satisfaction, or is there always a lot of lack of satisfaction with you because what drives you is winning championships. Um, I don't. I, I mean, I was happy to be back and um, happy it was going well. But I don't think I was satisfied. And um, it all happened so fast. Honestly, you don't really have time to be satisfied. Mm-hmm. Um, we was making the playoff push. AD kept everybody locked in. Rondo kept everybody locked in. So. The main goal was to try to win the championship. I mean, really, that's all we was locked in on. Um, we was making a really good push, and then, as everybody knows, Big Cuz went down and uh, kind of changed everything up. But 
I didn't really have time to really focus on that. Honestly, I was trying to stay locked in and win. Tell us about Rondo as a leader. I've heard a lot of stuff about Rondo as a leader. You've shared a couple of stories with me about Rondo as a leader, and I'm not going to ask you to share them now, but you know, <laughs> just tell us about Rondo as a leader. Uh, man, Rondo's the best leader I've ever played with, honestly. Um, just because he's a competitor, he knows the game better than anybody I've ever been around, and uh, he's always locked in. He's always wanting to get better. He's he, he leads by example. He's just like honestly the the perfect leader, really. I mean, he did a great job of pushing us, and he's one of the main reasons why we got to the playoffs that year. So, AD gets traded, and your Pelicans are now in a re, in a rebuilding process, a full rebuild. What has that process been like down there? Oh, it's been a lot of fun, man. Um, it's been a lot of changes, a lot of different stuff happening. But uh, I've been fortunate to be a part of a lot of good events, honestly. And then um, we had a really exciting season this year. I think um, we were going to make a push. Hopefully the season comes back and we can still make a push to make the playoffs. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's been fun, honestly. We got a real exciting team down here. So you suffered an injury right before training camp, and 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 got the work right right off the bat, and you're not able to were not able to play. How devastating was that injury to you? You know, with knowing your situation this year and what you were going to mean to the team, and how has your rehab been? Um, when it happened, I mean, it was it was terrible, man. I was so frustrated because um, I was really excited about the year coming up, really excited about the team. But, um, I mean, honestly, the rehab has been really, really, really good. Uh, it feels great now. Everything is going great as far as rehab. I've had the opportunity to learn a lot of things off the court this season and uh, try, my th- try my hand in a lot of other things this season. So, I mean, it all worked out for the best. I just have a couple more questions for you, D-Mail. During your time at Kentucky – what was the hardest atmosphere to play in, and who was the, who had the livest crowd, the most hostile student section, and who came? You know, being, you know, who who really brought it with with, you know, in the SEC every single night when you went on the road. In the SEC. Yeah, who was the toughest team in the conference? The toughest, the toughest uh, atmosphere, the toughest uh, atmosphere in the conference. Toughest atmosphere. Um. Uh, Florida was always nice. Uh, Tennessee was solid there for a couple years. Vandy had a nice uh, atmosphere. Um, Ole Miss did for a couple years. They were nice a couple years. They had a really nice atmosphere. Uh, That's probably the best ones, though, in the SEC. Outside of the SEC, I would probably say uh louisville of course that was always a crazy game the atmosphere in that game was always one of the best i've ever played in and uh we went to north carolina too and um it was pretty crazy in there too those are some big schools with some big programs and some big name players and you were fortunate enough to get to uh participate in you know play in those games and those atmospheres being at mason county and the university of kentucky with the tradition that both schools have, one thing that everybody knows is you're going to get everybody's best shot. You didn't get to play any games in high school or any games in college where every single time you walked on the floor, the other team was going to attempt to play their best game to say that they beat Mason County or beat Kentucky. How do you mentally prepare yourself for not a game, but for a season. When you know that in high school it's going to be 30 games, in college it's going to be 35, 36 games with the tournament run, where every game you're getting everybody's best shot. How do you mentally prepare for that? Uh, I mean, I think think we enjoyed it. I feel like all the teams that I've been on has put in enough work to be confident in uh, what they're going to display on the court. So it's just – are you deep enough to beat us, basically, when it comes down to the end of the day? Um, we feel like we put in enough work. We was all confident in our ability, so we had fun with it. Every time we would go somewhere in Kentucky, it would be a whiteout, redout, blackout, or whatever the case may be, and we had fun ruining their night. Besides Chris Lofton, 
and the Moorhead State and Playground legend Brian Miller, your father. Mm -hmm. um, who else probably – and you can just give me a couple names because you've named a lot of guys that you played with that were older than you and stuff through the years. But besides Chris and your dad, who else probably had the biggest impact on you through the years from your local – from your local era, from your local. Uh, man, I don't know. I don't know. That's a tough one. Well, I'll let you come back to that one. All right, that'll be the last question, but right. I'm going to um, ask you two more questions, honestly, and be honest with me, because I think I might have been there. What age did you beat your pops the first time? Ah, man. Um, probably about ninth, tenth grade. Okay, so you were probably, probably five, around there. Fifteen, probably maybe tenth grade. I would say around tenth grade. Fifteen, but maybe it sixteen. Like, it it wasn't like consistently though. Right. You know what I'm saying? But I think the first time I won was like tenth grade. I'm going to give you a short list of names of people who you have played with during your career, and you tell me the first thing that comes to your mind, word or phrase, um, and what those guys mean to you. And it doesn't have to be uh, basketball-related. Jody Meeks. <laughs> Jody. Jody's a funny dude, man. Uh, Jody meant a lot to me because he was one of the leaders on the team my freshman year, him and uh, Pat. Patrick Patterson, and they kind of took me under their wing when I was young, and they were some really good dudes. So that's 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 a really good guy right there. Um, Patrick Patterson. Patrick Patterson. That's still my boy to this day, man. That's like uh, that's like my big bro right there. Um, but he's a clown though, man. That's the first thing that comes to my mind when talking about him. He's a good dude, man. Like I said, him. Was one of, he was one of the main players to take me under their wing my freshman year, and me and him have been close ever since. John Wall. Jay Wall. Uh, he's probably – he was probably the most talented person at Kentucky. At Kentucky. Like, during the Kentucky stint, like, while they were at Kentucky, I think he was, a, I think he was probably the most talented player that I played with at Kentucky. DeMarcus Cousins. That's another talented dude right there, man. But I would say that he was probably the most competitive player that I've played with. Mm -hmm. Josh man, Harrelson. love for the game is crazy. Josh Harrelson, uh, that's another good friend of mine still to this day. Uh, real good, funny dude, genuine guy. And, uh, I mean, he was a great basketball player too. Terrence Jones. Uh, T. Jones. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about T. Jones, man. <laughs> T. Jones, T. Jones is crazy, but that's my guy, man. And he's he's probably one of the most talented players to come to Kentucky while I was there. Uh, Michael K. Gilchrist. Gilly is probably the most genuine dude. Uh, just a really good guy, really humble guy. One of the best teammates I've ever had. Anthony Davis. Hey, D, that's my that's my boy. Um, another another goofy dude, but a uh, really good guy, really good teammate. Another great teammate, one of the best that I've ever had. Would do anything for his teammates. Okay, and now I'm gonna give your boy. Okay, because you guys spent a lot of time at Kentucky together. Your boy, DeAndre Liggins. Oh, that's my brother right there, man. We like you said, we spent a lot of time together. He was my roommate our first three years. Then I played with him again um, down here in New Orleans, and uh, I played against him in Germany. So that's 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 like one of my brothers right there, man. Me and him real close. Whenever I would make it up the games, and we would go to Cheddar's to eat after the game, there was always different people that was there, but DeAndre was there every time. <laughs> <laughs> that's my dog, um, Trevor Setti. That's my boy. Everybody know that's my boy, man. Like I said, he was on the, he was one of the guys on the high school team. We grew up playing together since like the fourth grade. I was always at Trev's house. Like we still close to this day. So that's that's my boy right there. 
D, take care of your wife and your kids, man. Words can't express. There are not enough adjectives to express express how, you know, uh, privileged I am to have you on my show. I'm trying to get this thing up and going, and you've been the biggest guest so far. Um, next to your dad, I got to throw that out there because I don't want him punching me in my chest when I see him. And uh, that you know, you know, like I know that's what's gonna happen if I don't say him. So, so, so I appreciate you being on the show. Um, you did a great job. And um, I'll see you this summer. Definitely. I appreciate you having me on here, big bro. All right. Peace All right. out. Darius yeah. Miller, 2012 Kentucky National Champion, 2018 Kentucky State Champion. Um, dude is a monster. And if you don't follow college basketball, if, if you don't follow college basketball or you weren't following college basketball when he played, look back and, and YouTube and Google Darius Miller, Kentucky, and you'll see big shot after big shot, dunk after dunk, big play after big play. And he is genuinely humble, and he's a great individual, and it was a privilege to have him on Talk Sports to me tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Um, tomorrow night we have another good guest with us, and so I'm not going to drop the uh, ball on who it's going to be, but please – just tune in tomorrow night for episode 28 of Talk Sports to Me. You guys make the show go. I'm out.